Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Though that will be the scope of the text covered today, I'm going to read down through verse 26 so that you're able to see the entire context, and this is what we will flow into next week. And I do pray this, that God is doing a revolutionary work in your hearts and in this entire church body through the study of the book of Philippians. We've only been in the book for four or five weeks now, but there's tremendous heart and tremendous message that Paul is conveying to the Philippian church and by extension to our own church body. I would challenge you, don't let it pass you by without allowing it to transform your mind and your life as we study this precious book. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to begin in really the middle of verse 18. Paul said, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Well, in this passage of Scripture, Paul contemplated his upcoming trial before Caesar. After waiting in Rome for two years, not to mention his time in a Caesarean prison, and then his time being transported to Rome, Paul was finally about to have his day in court. And no matter who you are, it had to be a bit intimidating to anticipate this day. When his day in court came, Paul would enter the magnificent imperial complex in Rome, accompanied by imperial guards. He would stand before his accusers who had traveled all the way from Jerusalem just to argue that he should be executed. He would also stand before a number of ranking Roman officials in Caesar's court, and ultimately he would stand before the Roman emperor Nero himself. Nero is infamous for his psychopathic cruelty. He hadn't quite fallen off his rocker at this time when Paul was scheduled to stand before him, but the screws were coming loose and it wouldn't be very long before that happened. He was a man who was insanely suspicious of any rivals. At this point in time, he'd already executed his own birth mother and several other high-ranking and close officials whom he suspected of treason or of being rivals to the throne. He wasn't exactly a man of integrity that one could trust to do what was just. And yet Paul would have to wait while the Jews stood before Nero and slandered his name, particularly accusing him of sedition, which was the main charge that had been leveled against Paul. And hearing that particular accusation before Nero no doubt would have been unnerving because of his incredible suspicion of anyone that would rise up against him or his government. Those Jews would try to manipulate Nero into having Paul executed. And then Paul would be given the floor. He would finally look Nero in the eye, have the opportunity to defend himself. And when he was done, Nero would either free Paul or would sentence him to death. Again, regardless of who the accused might be or how bold you were, or how mature you were, that is a tremendous amount of pressure to undergo. And our text today reflects Paul's thoughts as he prepared for his day in court. This is what was running through his mind on the eve of that trial. And Paul's resolve to magnify the Lord at any cost is pretty incredible. But there's also a very human element to our text. Paul understood that this trial would be one of the most difficult experiences of his life. And so this, this passage is very challenging. It's very moving. 
And yet there's also great grace in Paul's testimony. I'd like to begin our study today by focusing on Paul's goal as he thought about this upcoming trial. And the goal was this, that we are to boldly manifest the glory of God. Ultimately, that's what he was hopeful towards. That's what he was driving at. That's what he was planning for. And here again, we see verse 20, chapter 1 and verse 20. Paul said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified. I want you to consider, first of all, in that thought, the temptation that any person might have to be ashamed of the truth in such a difficult circumstance. Any normal person in Paul's positions would have two huge concerns on their heart and mind. First of all, if you were standing before Nero being charged with sedition, you'd naturally want to make sure that he knew above all else that you were one of the good guys. And that the gospel was not a threat to Rome, as the Jews were claiming. And so it would be, in that sense, very tempting, no doubt, to smooth the rough edges of the gospel. But Paul knew that the gospel in itself is offensive to the natural man. It declares, for example, that there is only one Lord and Savior. And his title is not Caesar, nor is his name Nero. And so what does one do in such a case? Do you downplay some truth? Do you dodge around some of the sharp cutting edges of the gospel, softening it or even fudging the truth a little bit? If you wanted these guys to like you, you may have no other choice. Of course, a second natural concern when facing the death penalty is that you don't want your head chopped off. And so anybody would naturally want to make a defense that would convince Nero to let them go free. And Paul acknowledged these concerns in verse 20 when he said that, first, he didn't want to be ashamed when he stood before Caesar. In other words, as Paul contemplated his trial, he didn't want to be ashamed of what he believed or even deny what he believed. However, it's pretty clear that backing off from the truth was not an option. And that's because Paul wasn't ultimately focused on saving his life. He wasn't ultimately focused on looking respectable or vindicating himself or becoming Caesar's friend. Rather, I would have you notice, once again, Paul's singular focus as he anticipated his trial. He said that in keeping with his earnest expectation and hope, his prayer was that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, as we consider the fact that Paul's goal was to boldly manifest the glory of God, we know first that there's the temptation, or there would naturally be the temptation to be ashamed of the truth or to soften it in some way. And secondly, I want you to see, though, the passion for God's glory that Paul had. It's pretty clear that Paul had one goal and one goal only for his defense. He wanted Christ to be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. In other words, Paul was not going to play the legal game that so many lawyers play today, where they bend or they twist the truth in order to get what they want. No, Paul had one simple goal. He wanted to clearly and boldly declare the truth of the gospel. He didn't view this as a trial so much as he viewed it as an opportunity to preach. He wanted Nero. He wanted his Jewish accusers. He wanted every Roman official in that room to hear that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that salvation is only available in Christ. Even if just for a moment, the imperial hall would echo with the truth of the gospel. And Jesus Christ would be magnified in front of all those people. And notice that Paul left open the possibility that one of the ways he may end up magnifying Christ in his body may be by sacrificing his life. If it was the Lord's will, Paul would gladly declare the worthiness of Christ by dying for his great name. Paul's testimony is so challenging on several fronts to us. 
First and foremost, Paul reminded us that we are not on this earth to serve ourselves or to glorify ourselves. Life is not about making ourselves look good. No, we're here to magnify the Lord, to make him look good, to let it be known that God is great, to declare all of his glorious attributes, especially as they're revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. My job is to magnify God to everyone around me. The word magnify is a very important word. It's a very simple and yet interesting word. It means to enlarge. I've enjoyed doll sheep hunting for many years in Alaska. And one of the most important tools is a quality spotting scope with a high level of magnification, which enables me to magnify an animal that's afar off and make a proper judgment about its legality. I can then assess whether it's worth the effort to stalk on foot for miles over rough terrain to, a, to approach that animal and to try to stalk it. And so to magnify something is to take that which is distant or faintly seen and enlarge it to make it look close and personal, displaying it clearly, displaying it crisply and sharply down to the minutest detail so that it can be seen for its worthiness. And while most people in this world think nothing of God, or they think very little of God, and He is afar off from their thoughts, our mission is to magnify God so that He is brought into full view, into their full field of vision, in all of His glory, in all of His wonder. And they can realize His singular worthiness. We should be so challenged by Paul's singular focus in magnifying Christ, no matter what it cost him. And Paul's testimony also challenges us with the fact that very often glorifying the Lord means accepting the world's rejection. Of course, it's nice when people respect us for our faith. Sometimes we even may tell ourselves that we can't really be good witnesses unless the world respects us and that we have to keep our personal influence at any cost. So consider the potential impact of Paul's trial for a moment. Christianity was relatively new to the Roman Empire, and these Roman officials that he was going to speak before, including Nero, had probably never heard the gospel. If they came away impressed with Paul, who knows what the outcome could have been? Maybe Christianity would gain the same legal protection that Judaism enjoyed. Just think of all the good that could be done if Christianity gained that kind of protection. Wouldn't it be worth it to fudge just a couple of things or soften just a couple of things to gain that protection? Well, Paul said, absolutely not. The only way that Paul could magnify the Lord was to accurately and boldly declare the truth, regardless of the outcome. If that meant offending Nero and being put to death, then so be it. God's glory mattered more than Paul's life. It mattered more than Roman approval of the gospel that he preached. It's not about gaining popularity. It's not about people in the world's culture liking and accepting us, but about bringing glory to God, making Him manifest and magnifying His, uh, His character and who He really is in His personage before people's vision. And so as hard as it may be, folks, I'm talking particularly to those that are believers here and especially members of True North Baptist Church, as hard as it may be, we, may, we must embrace the offense of the cross. Of course, we're not looking to needlessly offend people. We want to be compelling. We want to be winsome. We want people to listen because we want them to get saved. We should do nothing to offend by our manner or by our presentation. But we do have to realize that no matter how loving and how gracious and how generous we may be, the gospel will offend people, and we can't allow the offense of the gospel to stop us from sharing it. Here's what it does. Here's why it's offensive. It will naturally cut deeply into a person's conscience. It will condemn them for their sin. It will show them their injustice before God. It will crush them under a heavy burden of guilt. It'll lead them to realize they cannot save themselves by anything that they do. It'll point them to God's only solution for their sin, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. It'll expose them to God's compassionate offer of mercy and grace. 
if they'll humbly bow before him and receive those truths for themselves. It's a painful conclusion. It's an agonizing conclusion to which people must come, but it's absolutely necessary if they will be saved. And so we must boldly and faithfully preach that Jesus saves. Jesus alone saves. Notice again the testimony of Paul's life. Paul's expectation from our text was that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. In other words, ever since Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, his life was about the faithful and bold declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he'd always done, and that's what he fully expected to do when he stood before Caesar. If it meant that Nero was pleased with him and let him go free, great. If Nero was highly offended and had Paul executed because his conscience was bothered by the message, so be it. But nothing would stop Paul from boldly declaring the gospel. Especially since we live in a safe nation with religious liberty that abounds, we desperately need to be impacted by Paul's testimony. Many of you know the story of a missionary by the name of Jim Elliott. He only lived to be 28 years old. Because in the year 1956, a secluded tribe in South America killed him while he was trying to bring the gospel to them for the very first time. It was a bold and courageous mission. And Jim Elliott made the ultimate sacrifice because he believed that the gospel matters above all else. And God used the story of Elliot's death and the death of the other four missionaries who also gave up their lives to make a profound impact on American churches. It was widely publicized and widely known even in secular newspapers across our country. Part of what makes Jim Elliot such a powerful, powerful figure is that his death for the gospel reflected the consistent passion of his life up to that point. He made the following statement, seeking to challenge Christians in American churches, and it complements Paul's testimony very well about his courageous boldness in sharing the gospel. Eliot said this of American churches, We are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace, while we profess to know a power that the 20th century does not reckon with. But we are harmless and therefore unharmed. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men, but brass, outspoken boldness is required to take part in the comradeship of the cross. We are sideliners, he said, coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers, while we are content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged, the world cannot hate us because we are too much like its own. We are not dangerous to them. And he ended by saying, oh, that God would make us dangerous. Now, there is a great need, folks, for dangerous Christians, as Jim Elliott said, who are far more concerned to make Jesus Christ known than to keep the peace and to fit in. And so I want to challenge you to become dangerously bold to the forces of darkness because you're passionate about the glory of God. You're passionate about magnifying God and Jesus Christ and his cross. And you're passionate about the spread of the gospel. I would say this, maybe you've been thinking about sharing the gospel with your neighbor, with a family member, with a co-worker for a very long time. Maybe you've considered the need to be uh, deeply involved in the church's evangelistic outreach, but fear keeps holding you back. I want to urge you to make it happen. Amen. Or maybe everybody in your workplace knows that you're a Christian, but you've always carefully avoided the offense of the gospel. They won't be won to Christ by your friendship. Don't be a jerk. But again, love Christ and love people enough to confront them with their sin and with the fact that Christ alone saves. Remember that you're never to be with the lost to socialize. You are to be with the lost to evangelize. That's the purpose. Don't be afraid to be dangerous.
Let's all pray that God would give us a heart like Paul, which resolves that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, that is all of my life, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Sacrifice whatever is needed to give your time and to give your life to this great cause. It's never too late to get deadly serious about this matter. You're never too old. You're never too busy. And I pray that this message does not merely stir anyone emotionally and stop there, but that it'll sink deeply into your soul in the form of a settled commitment to God that you'll use your life for this purpose from this day forward. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never bowed the knee before Him as your Lord, I hope that you'll see that this message, which Paul was willing to die for, was willing to die to declare, is the very message that you desperately need to hear and believe above all else. Specifically, you need to understand that there is only one God, that He is your Creator, that you are responsible to Him, and that you have violated His holy law by repeatedly sinning against Him. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And the good news of the gospel is that Christ will save you from God's wrath if you simply repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ, submitting your soul to him. If you do that, you can be secure in the compassionate grace of God. And like Paul, you can face life or you can face death without fear because your life is in Christ. If you've never received the gospel, I hope you will today. I hope that you'll bow your heart before Christ even right this moment and receive him. And so verse 20 expresses tremendous boldness on Paul's part. But maybe it seems out of reach for you. Maybe you're thinking, there's no way that I could ever be that bold and that missional in my life. Well, I want you to notice secondly in verse 19, Paul's confidence. We can boldly declare Christ's glory. Let me read verses 20 through 26 to you again. He spoke of my earnest expectation and, in, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. I, I don't know is what he said. I, I'm not sure. For I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, note that word confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now, when we read through verses 20 through 26, we tend to assume that Paul was a superhuman machine, don't we? How could anybody face such a significant trial with such confidence and such resolve? And how could any normal human being so coolly debate whether life or death is better? It's impressive. We'd probably be lying if we said that we could sincerely think and behave exactly the same way. As a result, you may not be sure how applicable Paul's words are to you. It's very important that we see that Paul's incredible confidence was not rooted in himself, but it was rooted in the same gospel grace that every single true believer possesses. And so if you're in Christ, you can stand in the grace of God just like Paul did. In light of that, I want you to notice first that Paul's confidence itself. It's important to note that, that verse 18 is a transitional statement. In verses 12 through 17, Paul reflected on how God was using his imprisonment to advance the gospel. We studied that last week. As a result, he responded in verse 18 by saying, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. And then Paul's perspective shifted from present joy to future joy. He adds this, yea, and will rejoice. Paul was confident that he would have joy in the future, and he told exactly why in verses 19 through 26. In particular, he said in verse 19, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
You might initially be led to think that Paul was saying that he was sure he would be found not guilty at his trial. However, the text is clear that Paul was concerned about something far more significant than a not guilty verdict. First of all, while Paul was pretty confident about how his trial would go, he was not 100% certain. He ended verse 20 by saying he didn't know whether he would live or die. But he had a very different confidence in verse 19. Also, the Greek word from which salvation is translated in verse 19 is soteria. And that word is almost exclusively used in the spiritual realm in the New Testament. And finally, the first part of verse 19 is a quote from Job 13, 16. And that's significant because if you know anything about the book of Job, you know that Job's friends were certain that Job was suffering all that he was because God was judging him for some hidden sin. But Job was certain that he was innocent. And in Job 13, 16, he declared with confidence that he would be saved. That is, vindicated when he stood before God even if his physical life was taken at that time. Job knew that God saw his heart. God knew his character. God knew whether he was innocent. And Paul was expressing the same type of confidence in what he said here. He didn't know for sure how the fickle Caesar Nero would rule on his case, but he knew that someday he would stand before a far more significant judge. And among other things, he was going to give an account of whether or not he was faithful during his trial before Nero and before Nero's court. And Paul was certain that in that day, he would be delivered, he would be saved, he would be vindicated, God would approve of Paul's defense, and God would be pleased. And by the way, that verdict was far more important than Nero's. We ought to find tremendous comfort in that type of hope, because like Nero, people around us are often unpredictable. They're often fickle, whether in the workplace or whether anywhere else throughout our community. When you share the gospel and when you confront people's sin, they may not always respond well. In fact, at times they may get very angry. They may even get combative or violent. Of course, uh, there there are so many other contexts where people also don't treat us fairly or respond as they should to our words or our actions. So if you live your life obsessed with the approval of people, you probably won't share the gospel very often. Or you're going to be incredibly disheartened a lot, even if you do share the gospel often. But you don't need to have any such fears with God. He perfectly sees your heart. He sees when you're striving to please Him. And someday, each one of us can be assured that He will vindicate our efforts when we stand before Him. Praise the Lord for that. And as such, I would challenge you, don't live your life pressing for the approval of men. Again, to balance that, this doesn't mean to be rash. It doesn't mean to be harsh. It doesn't mean to be abrasive or unnecessarily um, uh, uh, uncivil with people, right? To the contrary, the Bible teaches us that your speech should always be with grace as you share the gospel. But live your life to please the Lord, knowing that he will vindicate you someday. And so Paul was certain that he would be vindicated before the Lord. But notice that his confidence was not ultimately in himself. Look at the source of Paul's confidence. Paul said that he was confident that he would be delivered through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is a fascinating little statement. In particular, Paul believed that the prayers of the Philippians would play a vital role in his defense before Caesar. He knew that they were praying for him. And he knew that in response to their prayers, the Holy Spirit of God would supply the strength and the boldness in his life to clearly articulate the truth and magnify the Lord as he stood before Caesar. Friends, it would do us very well to grasp this. Paul simply did not ever think of Christian life as lived in isolation from others in God's kingdom. He may have been the one in prison. He may have been the one headed for trial. But he saw the Philippians and others as inextricably bound together with him in the Lord and in the Lord's ministry. He assumed that their prayers and as a result, God's abundant supply of strength and boldness would be the means that God used once again to bring glory to himself. 
Now that puts a whole different spin on praying for missionaries and praying for other gospel ministries. It's not uncommon to hear a missionary make this type of statement when I communicate with them. What we need more than anything are your prayers. That's not just a trite statement. We shouldn't doubt the sincerity of that statement. It really is true. We perform a vital ministry of partnership when we pray for our missionaries. And in this particular case, the Philippian prayers provided Paul with the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That bountiful supply was the very reason that Paul was confident that he would be faithful in his bold declaration of the truth at his trial and that he would be vindicated before God. Paul's confidence was not in himself. It was not in his own courage. It was not in his own boldness. He understood that he could not stand on his own, but that by God's grace, he could do anything that he needed to do. He could do anything that God called him to do. And the same is true for us. You can be bold. You can be courageous for Jesus Christ. You can be dangerous, as Jim Elliott said. You can magnify the Lord and effectively share the gospel in the strength that God himself gives. And so pray for the supply of the Spirit. And let's pray that God would give this supply to one another in this church as representatives go out to share the gospel in this community. And let's pray that God would give this supply to our missionaries and other partners in ministry. And then let's go, sharing the gospel, trusting that the Spirit will give boldness and will give wisdom. And finally, I want you to notice the foundation of it all in verse 21. The reason I pray, the reason I speak, the reason I'm willing to sacrifice everything is because, according to verse 21, Christ is my life. For me, or for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And for today, I just want to zero in on the first part of that statement. The phrase, for to me, indicates that this is a very personal confession or testimony of Paul. This verse reflects the heart of who Paul was as a person. Specifically, Paul literally said, to me, to be living, to be alive, Christ. There's not a whole lot to explain about that statement. Paul was saying as succinctly as he possibly could that his life on earth was about one thing and one thing alone, Christ. Paul's hope was in Christ. Paul's strength was in Christ. Paul's joy was in Christ. His purpose was in Christ. Christ dominated everything about him. And so Paul lived to fulfill the mission that Christ had given to him. It's such a simple statement. For to me, to live is Christ. And yet it is profoundly significant. It means everything. It forms the foundation for everything for a true believer. And by God's grace, it should be true of every one of us. To me, to live is Christ. I'm not here to get rich. I'm not here to gain glory. I'm not here to enjoy this pleasure or that pleasure. I'm not here to have this experience or that experience. I'm not here to accomplish this or that. No, Christ is my life. And everything must turn on that hub alone. One of the earliest church leaders to embrace Paul's zeal was a man by the name of Ignatius of Antioch. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. He was best of friends with a man named Polycarp, another of John's disciples. He became the leader of the church in Antioch, the church from which Paul and Barnabas had been sent as missionaries. Throughout his ministry, he fought like Paul for a pure gospel that magnified the Lord Jesus Christ. In particular, he resisted the pull of Jewish legalism that tried to add to the gospel or Greek Gnosticism, which tried to mysticize the gospel. But of course, that put him in the crosshairs of both the Greek majority and the legally protect, protected Jews in the Roman Empire. And the details aren't 100% clear. All of it's not fully recorded in history, but ultimately Ignatius was arrested and he was sent to Rome to die. According to Irenaeus, another important early church father who was discipled by the aforementioned Polycarp, Ignatius was brutally executed in the city of Rome in 115 AD. According to Irenaeus, he was 
marched into the Colosseum in Rome, where the Roman crowd was entertained as Ignatius was torn apart by wild animals. Had to have been an awful way to die. But before his death, Ignatius, as he was being marched to Rome, he wrote seven letters to various churches, which are still some of them recorded in history. And in those letters, he pled with them, with those churches, to magnify Christ no matter the cost. And one of the letters that he wrote was to the church in Rome where he was being taken to be executed. He didn't ask them in that letter to plead for his life. Instead, he embraced the opportunity to magnify the Lord through death. And in that letter, he wrote these words. Bring on the fire, bring on the cross. Bring on the hordes of wild animals. He knew it was ahead for him. (laughs) Let them wrench my bones out of socket and mangle my limbs and grind up my body. Bring on all the hideous tortures from the devil. Just let me get to Christ. That was his testimony. Just let me get to Christ. He said, nothing on this wide earth matters to me anymore. I am at the point where I would rather die for Jesus Christ Then rule over the whole earth. He alone is the one that I seek, the one who died for us. It is Jesus that I long for, the one who for our sake rose again from the dead. And I would put before your hearts today the challenge, like Ignatius and like Paul, may we say, for for to me, to live is Christ. I just want to magnify him and to die is gain. And I would ask you this question, would you fall on your face in humble submission before him today? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the testimony recorded in Scripture for us from so many years ago and from this man, Paul, who was anticipating this trial, the most difficult circumstance through which he would pass very likely in his life. And as a man with all the the human limitations and fears and worries and doubts, that he was willing to stand in such a bold supply of confidence that you provided him, I thank you for giving us this example in his life. We thank you for the faithful character and heart that he displayed and the way that he challenged others in the face of that to stand for you as well. Oh Lord, may you help us as a church that each one of us would be living for Christ, for him alone. And if there is anything that is a hindrance in the life of any of your saints here, that it might be laid aside and placed on the cross this morning. I pray that you would challenge the heart of every person in this audience today, knowing that there are some that are mixed amongst us who may have grown complacent with the message of the gospel, who may have heard it before and heard it even again yet today, and have not moved to action to submit their lives before you. I pray that your, the sword of, of your word would sharply pierce and cut very deep and affect their consciences about their sin and the need to humble themselves before you in total submission, and that this might be a day of great victory in the lives of many people as we look to this example that we've studied today. In Jesus' name, amen.